taught by Julian Simpson. He seems pretty cool. He talks about graphs. Graphs are nice. He's got many surprises in his talk, and so everyone welcome him. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, everyone. So um, today's talk is surrounded by graphs, and I might as well come out and say it. We think you are surrounded by graphs. So before we really get set up, there's this obligatory introduction slide. But I wanted to turn it around on you guys because I've done talks before where I've, I've totally missed the mark on the audience. Oh, there's the sweet spot for the audio. So I've totally missed the mark and I, I, I've kind of gone, gone at a really sort of high level on something where everyone wanted detail and, um, and vice versa where I, I, I once bored an, an audience in Copenhagen for about an hour and a half and um, people fell asleep and everything. So. I want to get that right. So really, the introduction is about you guys. Now, if, if it was a much smaller audience than this, I'd actually make you go around and sort of say what your interests were, but um, it may be a little bit, a little bit harsh. So um, I'm just going to do a couple of shows of hands on things, basically. So who is a Java developer? Or writes some Java, or doesn't hate it? Okay, all right, cool. <laughs> and who used a NoSQL database last year? Okay, about a third. Who's used Neo4j in a year? We've been around for donkey's years, so okay, right. That is very helpful, thank you. So I will introduce myself then. So um, my career in Unix-like operating systems um, started just up the road in the late 90s where I worked at a company called Clear. Um, I worked there a couple of years. I went to uh, seek my fame and fortune in London and didn't find it. Did come back with a wife and kids though, so that was all right. But yeah, I was around doing Solaris admin at the dot-com crash and then it all went horrible and Linux disrupted my uh, cushy Solaris job anyway. But I kind of moved on by then. Um, I got a job working for a company called ThoughtWorks, um, basically building people's Java code. And um, that was a lot of fun. However, it gets really, really irritating to have a room full of people developing in an IDE on Windows, and they throw the code and say, it doesn't work on Solaris. But it works on Windows, so that matters. Never mind that they were, those days are often on uniprocessor Windows machines, and they'd have a um, deploy into a multi-core Solaris machine. Must be my problem. Anyway, so as a reaction to all that, I kind of moved into the DevOps community, um, speaking about how we should all just get along and um, how we should get developers involved uh, in, in making code releasable. And, um, I'm going to take no credit for that. So someone made that a lot better. I'm not sure it was me. My only claim to fame there is that I actually went to the very first DevOps Days conference, unlike everyone else who claims they did and didn't. So if anyone wants to talk over a beer later about um, how, how, how Dev, DevOps didn't actually change the world, or did, that would be a fun talk. I think we did horrible things to the configuration management community along the way. But now my job is a developer at uh, Neo Technology. I, I work on internal stuff. I don't work on the product. I did, I did used to, but uh, moving from London to New Zealand really made it difficult to collaborate with people in Sweden. That was my, my biggest learning last year was that you can't. So I'm going to talk about the product at the end of this talk, really, because um, I don't really want to ram that down your throats. I want to ram graphs down your throats. I'll be delighted if you guys want to start using me for j for projects, but um, that's not really the purpose of this talk. Uh, I am quite happy that we've announced 20 million funding today for, for Neo. That'll um, keep the ball from the door for a little while. Anyway, so this talk, what I want to do is kind of set the landscape for NoSQL and how graphs fit into that. We've tried really hard to 
position graphs as a separate category to NoSQL, but we always get lumped in, so we'll, we'll cover that. What graphs are, and some examples of that, and then I'm going to read you a story. Now, this may be your talk, um, but you guys also have this huge risk that um, we, we're going to be reading a, uh, a, a thing of, it's going to take a variable length of time to do. So, um, Rachel may have to hold up signs at me. If you guys think I'm, I'm going really too slow, um, we will try and speed up and we can do some Q&A or a demo at the end. If I'm going too fast, uh, please hold up your hand. And we'll go over some questions. And I have a few copies of the last print run of our graph databases book from O'Reilly. Um, this isn't such a fabulous giveaway because we're about to have a new print run, but um, there's some good stuff in the, in the back, especially about uh, different types of NoSQL database. So does anyone have a definition of NoSQL? Everything that's not a relational database. That's a pretty good one. Now, I stole Martin Fowler's um, definition of this. And bingo! Everything that's not a relational model nor using SQL. So, that's good. There's a bunch of other things that, that he, he's kind of um, posited and I mostly agree with. Mostly open source. I believe uh, some databases like Vertica are uh, lumped in the NoSQL category that aren't open source, but I think for the most part they are, which is a good thing. Designed to run on large clusters, mostly. Um, not all NoSQL databases do because the category is so wide, but I think everyone's trying to move towards that, you know, the, the, the horizontal scaling pattern. And it pains me to read this out, but based on the needs of 21st century web properties. Just, just, yeah. Um, but I believe what, what he's saying is that um, you know, not, not all websites need a highly, highly durable storage. Some websites can get away with an awful lot, and some of them, if they blow up, it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, that would be different in, say, finance or something, but... Yeah, you know, a lot of Web2 sites manage to cut corners and deliver stuff quickly, and that, that is pretty much a win for them. And the last key thing is no schema, which is probably a mostly as well, but um, the, the, the key thing is that it, it, it's probably optional at, at, at the strongest There's nothing in there about storing anything in there, is there? I, I think that's a Implied, basically. If you take out the data, you just call it a base. <laughs> so I must have get, pick up the habit of repeating the questions just in case they don't come on the audio. So, um, you know, the comment was, we didn't talk about storage. That's implied. So, There are four kinds of NoSQL database in the Neo technology view of the world, and that just happens to be shared with some other people as well. So I'm going to look at those. Key value stores. And I, I think if you've used a host file, you've, you've used a key value store. I, I, you, know, you look at the um, documentation for a bunch of Linux systems, they'll talk about the host database. And I, I think that everything from there on is fair game to call key value. Obviously, that's a a wide, a wide spectrum, but I think all the stuff is. Document is a bit more kind of um, specific, really. You're, you're persisting a JSON document like uh, MongoDB or CouchDB. Column family, like Cassandra, famously used for Twitter. And then finally, graph the finest of all the categories, uh, like uh, our product and um, a few others. And I stole most of the next um, eight or so slides from the, the book No Sequel Distilled by uh, Martin Fowler and Pramod Saladash. Um, and they've got some recommendations um, for where you should use it. So uh, 
I have faithfully reproduced those. So back to key value stores. Um, a simple hash table primarily used when all access to the database is via primary key. Well, that, that's, again, that's super wide. I don't believe... Um, no, the, the example I've given you is stolen from uh, React, I believe. And that, that is as, as simple as the API um, can get, you know, pretty much get and set. And what the value can be um, varies from database to database, but it could be scalar values like that. It, it could be a hash. It could be um, a, a more complex data structure, a list, something like that. Hard to generalize on this. So recommendations. Um, do use it for storing things like session information, user profiles and preferences, and shopping cart data. They justify that in, in their book by, by saying that you are using the key to kind of, as one great big namespace. Um, you know, in Redis, you can have buckets of, of keys, so you can effectively namespace them off. But this, this is a, a very natural fit if you had something like a list of usernames or session IDs or something, and you just want to persist those in a, in a nice, simple database. And, and the good thing is um, there's this pattern called polyglot persistence that um, Martin Fowler also uh, named. Don't throw everything into uh, one NoSQL database. Just choose, choose a good fit for a kind of storage that you have. You can leave everything else in your uh, relational database if it suits you. So this may simplify your life, and um, it may not even matter if you lose some of that session information. People just might have to log in again and curse you a couple of times. Uh, not recommended. Any case where you have relationships amongst the data, well, that's kind of hard to do. Um, you often can't do a transaction on multi-key uh, operations, so um, a complicated transaction may, may not work. If you want to do any, anything with a set of values also, that's not good. And not all key value stores will let you query by data. Obviously, you can use grep on your host file, but um, that, that's not the case with some other systems or you end up having to use something else to index it. So document databases. Who's used a document database recently? I've got about five, six. So yeah, these are web scale. If anyone hasn't seen the MongoDB as web scale YouTube video, it's a hoot. Not, not, not a comment on uh, MongoDB, a comment on um, people's assumptions about web scale. So self-describing hierarchical tree data structures which can consist of maps, collections, and scalar values. So I've chosen the most dumbest kind of example here. That could be quite a big document, and you could update individual bits of that document using MongoDB's um, APIs, which seem pretty sweet. And I like it because it's a really simple kind of way of doing things. Um, and the recommendations of that one are event logging, because you can write to um, parts of a document individually. Blogging with CMS, because um, lots of web systems will quite happily transform JSON into front-end pages, uh, web or real-time analytics, and e-commerce. Um, not recommended um, those complex transactions, because I don't believe you can, index, you can, you can query uh, across documents, but I don't believe you can do a transaction across multiple documents. You can actually query, a, um, query several documents at, at once, but if you have data changing all the time, like you don't have a, a fixed kind of schema in place, you won't actually see all of the responses, the, 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 the data. So varying aggregate structure basically means uh, be very careful about what changes in your app. 
course, we have about three times the number of people now, so my uh, careful, careful um, you know, po poll of who, who, who knew what about NoSQL and stuff is gone. Let's just roll with that. Um, I will repeat for those guys who just arrived. Um, <laughs> If you think this is um, really too slow, let me know. And if you think I'm going too fast, please raise your hand or shout at me. So, column family. I have to confess, this is, this is the one I really understand least. Um, obviously, Twitter have made excellent use of Cassandra, and um, I believe the main thing is schema flexibility and read performance that uh, makes Cassandra really popular. <sighs> Storing data with keys mapped to values and the values grouped into multiple column families, each column family being a map of data. I just can't read that and actually make sense of it. You're basically getting columns full of rows rather than rows of columns in your column family database. You can see here the, um, the really tired Hobbit example. Bilbo and Frodo don't have the same keys in their map. And that, that is, by design, that's the schema-free um, aspect of a column family database. Um, and you can off, off nest different columns in there as well. Martin and Promode suggest event logging as an interesting... Um, Thing again, you can, um, I believe, that read, uh, write, write performance to a column family database can be super fast. Also being good at um, persisting JSON again, so the same recommendation for con content management systems and blogging. But the last two are interesting, counters and expiring usage. So, so they have um, data types for counters, and you can actually tell data to self-destruct, which is cool. So if you have something like... Um, you know, records you need to keep for compliance for a certain amount of time, you can actually say, persist this, but kill it in 30 days or something, which is kind of sweet. Now, the fun bit is graph databases. Storing entities and relationships between those entities. And I think that's the first gigantic clue that um, graph databases are awesome because... It's really simple. And what I've done is um, take the same uh, cringy Hobbit thing and I've used the, our, our most simple um, Java API to, to show you the, um, the very basics of creating a node and giving some properties. We'll go into some more detail, obviously. So the thing I love is connected data is the recommendation because... 30 years ago, I don't believe data was very connected at all. Now it's just super, super connected. Everything is connecting, and it's a great use case for us. Uh, routing and dispatch and location-based services is, is another thing. Um, we have a customer in, in London who built their entire business around a graph database, uh, later got acquired by eBay, where they're basically choosing the, the fastest path to get goods to someone. And they demonstrated this by ordering a bottle of whiskey online and having it show up um, by the end of their talk. Recommendation is another classic for us, as well as fraud detection, where you're able to look at patterns and pull out the, the, the really strange, strange patterns. For fraud detection, that is also used by a bunch of... Um, People and, and the, the one downside is updating all of the entities in your database may hit, cause you to update the entire graph and you may hit um, performance issues. So I just want to clarify before we really get into nitty gritty of um, graphs what they actually are because I met a bloke at a conference last year and he said, what do you do? I work for Neo. Or what do they do? They make a graph database. And he says, oh, a graphical database. Cool. And I said, no, not cool. A, that's Microsoft Access. B, that's not cool. <laughs> so, hands up if you think this is a graph. Thank you. You're all very clever people. 
And I mean that sincerely because I am super impressed with the, um, both the speakers and attendees of this conference. How about this time? Hands everywhere, excellent. We already um, identified the right, right thing, and I'm just going to go into the, a quick sort of uh, jaunt into history as to why. So it's just the word graph. Graph means mark something, as, as far as my ancient Greek goes. So the word graph has been used lots of, lots of times for photography, lithography, steganography. But we have to go back to 1878 to find the first proper use of the word graph. And once I found that quote from J.J. Sylvester, thanks to the person who, um, who, who bought the, the document from Nature magazine so I could reproduce it, I then had to immediately uh, work out what a Kekulian diagram is. I stopped studying chemistry in sixth form. So, and it's that. That's benzene molecule, often surrounded with a snake eating its own tail, just for style. Um, but Kekul is the guy who gave us that depiction of, of, of molecules. And, and if, if you go back to the previous graph um, I just showed you, I, I think it's kind of dead on. So we really try and make sure that people think about charts versus graphs, and we always beat them up when they um, get it wrong. So... The history of graphs comes back to a guy called Lenhard Euler, who was born in Königsberg, Prussia, which is now um, Kalingrad in the Soviet Union, or is Russia as it's called today. Um, so, and what you do in the 18th century is you would posit these intellectual kind of challenges to each other. And, and someone said, is it possible to take a walk around Konigsberg and cross all the bridges and never retrace my steps? And because Euler was the super smart guy who gave us half of our maths, including functions, he didn't actually try and walk it around or draw it out on a piece of paper and, and throw it up and screw it up and throw it away. He actually used maths. So his insight was that it may be a map here, but you can reduce it to a, a far simpler structure. So he just thought, okay, River Pragel has two islands in the middle and a north and a south bank. So, okay, that's just four things. Four things with a bunch of connections between them. Actually, it looks like this. And as it turns out, you cannot solve the seven bridges of Konigsberg problem without sticking another bridge in, which people have suggested, but... Um, there it is. Euler, of course, came up with all the maths to, 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 um, uh, to prove beyond, beyond all doubt that it was impossible. I'm not going to go on that today, otherwise we'll run out of time. So I thought I'd do some simple examples of um, representing things as graphs and, and you know, what, what more appropriate um, thing than a make file to start with. So. I believe everyone knows what a make file is in this room or can easily find out. Um, and we've got three targets in the make file and there's some dependencies, or four if you count the uh, useless one at the top, which I should have marked with the dot phony. So I made my make file, I, I ran a dry run on it and I piped that output to a file called make to graph and it gives me a directed graph in graphers. Is there hands up if you're familiar with using graphers for visualizing stuff? Okay, about half the room. So it's just an excellent tool that's been around for donkey's years that allows you to programmatically draw a graph. So you can see here we've got some labels and we've got some, some nodes and it's declaring some relationships at the bottom. So we can turn that into a nice diagram which looks just like the other stuff I've shown you. So, 
If we do something that's um, a little more complex, let's talk about Apache Maven. This is one of the reasons I stopped doing build stuff in Java is because uh, I could cope with Apache Ant, but uh, this is a whole, whole new ball game. So it doesn't really show, show up well on the display, but what you're looking at is a collection of libraries that a project depends on. The libraries at the top, and you might just be able to see uh, it, it's a Maven plugin, so it depends on some Maven stuff. It also depends on some, some really common Java libraries, and then it turtles all the way down, down the dependency tree or graph. And I find this incredibly useful technique when you're trying to work out what the hell something does, because you can just visualize it all there. And this tool um, kindly shows uh, runtime dependencies in green and the test time dependencies in blue. So you can see if, uh, what the uh, different phases of Maven are going to do. And this morning I did manage to corner Linus and ask him about how he ended up choosing a graph to build Get On. And in some ways, gets more like a key value store, and in some ways, it's um, is a directed graph. And it turns out that um, back in the day when BitKeeper was still a thing, Larry McAvoy was all keen to use that. Tridge didn't like that at all. Linus was kind of stuck between these two guys. Okay, well, you should use this, and no, I don't want to. So, so Linus said he's trying to explain to, to Tridge how it all worked, and he, he started using a graph metaphor to explain it. And then before the, um, the organizers pulled him away to, to get to his keynote this morning, um, he explained that then that, that, that sort of turned into, into the we, we all use today. Um, and you can see in the diagram, graphs lend themselves very well to, to dealing with the, the branches that we create. Um, and I, I particularly like this one because someone's um, doing a rebase and you can see that we're actually disconnecting parts of the graphing moving around to make a simpler structure. How am I doing on time, Rachel? Um, 18 Elapsed? Yeah. Left. I'll be going to move on. And also, um, just for fun, you can also uh, visualize um, parts of a code base uh, with, with a graph. Lovely. And Rusty did this completely awesome graph, which uh, apparently took nine hours to build on his Athlon 1000 back in the day of uh, the 2.4 code base of every function in the, in the kernel. So I thought that was sweet and endorsed. So this is the really high risk bit of my presentation, because I'm going to read you a story honestly. <laughs> so who hasn't read a Choose Your Own Adventure book or, or any of the other you know, things? Okay, good, everyone's got it. So you, you, you make decisions when you go through the book. Turn to page if you want to slay the dragon, all that kind of stuff that 12 year olds are going to read. Yes. <laughs> so, today's book is Inside UFO 5440, um, published by Edward, written by Edward Packard, who sadly died um, last year. Uh, published in the early 70s, I believe. No, 82. So, starts with a warning do not read this book from end to end. So, for a bit of audience partition, participation, I'm going to read the first chapter. Probably fuzz over a few things, then I want some decisions. So, it's your first trip on the Concorde, the supersonic jet airliner that crosses the Atlantic in 3 hours and 45 minutes. Who flew here on Jetstar today? This week. Because that's the future of air travel. We used to think it was Concorde. Sorry about that. Right now you're at 57,000 feet in mid-flight from New York to Paris. You look up from the magazine you've been reading as a voice comes over the loudspeaker. This is Captain Ravel speaking. We're about halfway across the Atlantic now, at latitude 54, longitude 40. We've just come on a new course that will bring us over the coast of France in about 90 minutes. Those of you on the left-hand side of the plane may be able to see the southern tip of Greenland. 
You glance out the window, hoping to see Greenland. Instead, you see a gleaming white cylinder, several times larger than the Concorde, but without wings, engines, or ports. The object, glistening in the early morning sunlight, is coming straight at you. Look! The white-haired man sitting next to you leans towards the window to get a view. At what? Don't you see it? It's coming right at us. He opens his mouth to answer, but says nothing because you're no longer there. Turn to page six. You're sitting in a thick rubbery mat in a circular room. The room is bathed in a pale white light, yet you see no windows or doors or lamps. You remember now, sitting in the Concorde, the huge white object coming at you, the plane chattering, and where are you? Plane t light turns violet, and mixing with oranges and red, it brightens as the sun are about to rise. A voice is speaking, except it's not speaking. You're hearing thoughts entering directly into your brain. We are the Utai Masters. You are on the galactic ship Rakma, orbiting the planet Earth. You've been chosen to be a specimen in the galactic zoo in the imperial planet of Ra. If you refuse to cooperate, you'll be sent to Somo. You may make one statement. If you demand to be returned to Earth, turn to page three. If you want to know more about the Utai, turn to page four. Robert, what do you think? Four. All right. Tell me more about yourselves, you say. Why did you choose to visit Earth? We study Earth people as your science to study bacteria under a microscope. We came to Earth in search of Ultima, the, ult the planet of paradise. If you offer to help the Utai Masters find Ultima, turn to page 22. If you ask the Utai how they think they could reach Ultima visiting Earth, turn to 25. What do you think, Paul? 25. 25, cool. I think we'll finish at about 5 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they say you will cooperate, or you will cooperate. So you say, look, I'm a human, please. And they say, you are unsuitable, you will be erased, you will never know you've been in space. Turn to page 24. You're sitting in your room at home. Well, that's a turn up. What happened? Do you remember having board the Concorde um, and then something weird? Reaching into your pocket, you pull out a pebble the size and shape of a watermelon seed. Why is it heavy? You turn it over and you're about to toss it, toss it to the waste basket. basket. Does it go in or not? Turn to page 41 or 50. Okay. Thank God. <laughs> the strange object lands in the wastebasket with a thud, and you think no more about it. A few days later, you're talking with a friend of yours, Todd Hawkins. Did you see the airline pilot on TV last night? Todd asks. He and his crew swear that a couple of days ago they saw an alien spaceship over the Atlantic. Really? Yeah, it was at latitude 54, longitude 40, so they called it UFO 5440. At first they thought a passenger was missing, but then the doors have opened. There's no way a passenger could have disappeared. They finally decided the passenger list must have been wrong. You get a bit freaked out by that. You look at Todd, but you can never quite put your finger on why he, the thing he said would seem so discordant. The end. So, that was a fun I had my 12-year-old daughter read it, and she, she enjoyed it. I, I, I had it in my bag for the past um, few weeks, so I've actually been reading it on the bus, and um, yeah, it's been quite fun. So, I have destroyed the left-hand um, display. I don't know what we're going to do about that. Yeah, okay. Never mind. <laughs> so, and you can see you can de depict this as a graph as well. You're on Concord, you meet aliens. Um, I didn't actually write down that path, um, but you can see uh, go going off to, to the right hand side, you ask them about themselves, blah, blah, blah. Um, what I was hoping is that you'd end up, um, you know, falling asleep forever because they frankly didn't like you. Um, but there we go. So that's another Graphers document that I've, I've. Do you guys have? Have you ever see that? Okay. So so it, it's another uh, Graphers um, document like I, I showed before, and similar thing. So this is a screenshot from Neo4j where I, I actually spent days. 
sticking a bulldog clip on this book, trying to actually link all the things. I should have drawn it out on a um, whiteboard first, I think. Uh, but I, I did it. So, you can see here, I've got page number 111 here. That turns to a number even I can't read. Um, 20. And there is the entire structure of this book in a graph. Now, that's kind of cool, but it's not use useful to you at all. So, um, and I showed you we had a, a, you know, a basic API for manipulating or querying a graph. But even that didn't really work out. So for the past couple of years, we've been working on a query language called Cypher. And much as programmatic interfaces to things are convenient to the programmer, it doesn't work for everyone. And we find that a, you know, a SQL-like language is very kind of um, easy for everyone, especially one like ours. There's a cartoon about um, someone wanting some business data out of, the, out of the database and being told to go write a MapReduce job. But I think to, to finish it would um, break our uh, policies here at LCA. I'll send it to anyone if they want to see it. Um, so you can query or you can upgrade a graph. And we built it on ASCII art because Andrews' um, big insight was that Every time someone models something, they draw circles for an entity, and then they draw arrows, and they label the arrows, and so he decided just to, to make that um, in ASCII art, which I kind of like. And the other great contribution is that because our code base started its life around um, the turn of the century and the matrix was still cool, there's always been these jokes about the matrix and NEO, even though NEO stands for Network Engine for Objects, again, uh, showing its age a bit. He decided to um, name it after the bad guy in the Matrix who um, does a deal with the agents and tries to kill everyone, including the blonde lady and the other blokes whose names I really should have um, looked up. <laughs> so this is Cypher. And um, sorry about the, the ruining the whole screen thing for you guys on, on the, the far side. Um, it's really dead. Um, But you can see it's not a million miles away from um, any, another query language. Um, you can see create. We've, we've got our uh, circle for the, um, the entity, and we've got a bunch of attributes. Create, beginning, create a page. It's got a beginning label on it. It's got a page label on it. It's got a number and a synopsis. So. This is how I created the book, is just a, a series of, of cipher statements that, that just basically built up the graph. I ran a bunch of queries in our uh, Neo4j shell tool just on my, my laptop, and we can answer some questions about the, um, about the data that we created. So how many pages? Well, there's 80 pages that matter. I did actually exclude a few. How many endings are there? Uh, 27. So you can see we're using our match keyword. We're looking for anything that has an ending label on it, and we're returning the count. And we're making it pretty by, by uh, having a header of endings. How many decisions could you make? What I did was I'm, I stuck a property on the um, relationships that connect all the nodes together. So if there's a decision, um, that tells you how, how, what, what path you took through the book. So we need to look for. Um, a node that turns to another node with a particular type of relationship where it has a decision and I, I want the count of those decisions. So 59 decisions you can make during the book. And that adds up to 125 paths through the book, which is you know, reasonably good value for an avid reader to, to go through, keep, keep you going for a little while. So how's everybody with that? That'd be great. So, and you can see, we, we think it's, it's awesome because you can look at the structure 
you can actually query based on the structure. So the shortest path is four, four pages. And if you look at the top line of the query, um, match beginning turns to ending. And we can look at the, the, the length. We can apply functions to what we um, get returned, and we can pull back the shortest one. We can reverse the, the order, and thank you. Uh, we can reverse the order to get the longest. 19 pages you flip through. And if you correctly uh, limit that query, uh, you, you, can, you can see a depiction of, of the path with all of the um, uh, different nodes in there, synopsis in there. So, so a lot you can do. Now, the cool thing is, this book had an Easter egg in it. Ultima. Oh, I found, found the sweet spot for the audio. Ultima. So... The mad aliens are looking for this mythical paradise planet, and here it is. Probably looks better in real life. The, the, the um, you know, 80s uh, printing doesn't really do it justice. So, really, we need to find it. Now, no, no page actually linked to Ultima. You just had to flip through it. It told you not to flip through it, but you really had to, so you could actually discover the thing as like an Easter egg in the book, which is kind of nice. So, this is how we cheat. So match a page which has a synopsis of Ultima, and, um, and there it is. And you can see here that no page will, will, um, will actually link to Ultima. And you see, if you look at the, the query, you can see I've got an arrow in there. So, so I'm doing a directed query from a page to the page that, that I now know is page uh, 101. And nothing's there. But if I just match on any relationship in any direction, you can see here there's a second page um, where it says, after it's shown you that the um, awesome line drawings, it says all your new like immortal buddies and ultimately you hang out anytime you like. And you can uh, disappear off to there from, from your normal Earth life. Must be uh, pretty amazing in the, uh, for a 1982 reader. So... One of the nice things I, I find about our ability to um, display a graph is that you can actually look at your data and see what's wrong. Every time I broke the book when I was trying to import it and I, I'd failed to connect parts of it together, I'd actually um, visualize it and you, I, I could see, okay, th there's a bit missing. But this is as it's meant to be. There's just these two pages that are off by themselves because that, that's the hidden bit of the book. So... I believe I'm pretty much out of time. So I'm just going to do a quick spiel on Neo4j. As I said, my uh, purpose was not to um, convince you to use it, but just in case you're interested. It, we have an awesome community that's made lots of drivers. Uh, either our own um, staff have written a bunch of drivers, um, or we've just had people show up and, and, and make them. Uh, you know, people come up with Bless you. Um, cold fusion drivers and things that we would never expect people to want to use, but they, they show up and say, here they are. So we're loving the fact that people are sharing those back to the wider community. The very core of Neo4j is GPL. Uh, we, we have an enterprise version that's um, a fair GPL, and it's all written in Java and Scala with a bit of Bash and Ruby glue code kind of holding it together with Maven. Um, like I said, it was around 2000 that they uh, decided the net a network database would be cool, and they, they developed this database, and then it became open source in 2007. Um, we we're on GitHub, and yeah, we have a website, amazingly. So um, yeah, thanks for listening. And um, who has questions? For the entire thing. Okay.
Go. Uh, you said that uh, graph databases were for connected data. How would you distinguish between that and relation data? Uh, I don't think there's a difference between... I mean, the main difference I see between a graph database and a relational database is that the connections are persistent in a graph database. You create the relationship, whereas it just happens to be something you work out at runtime in a, in a relational database, that this foreign key matches this to the row. So, yeah, actually, if, as a relational database geek, I can, I can also field the answer to that question, which is with relational databases, the connections are generally visualized as being hierarchical. Whereas in a graph database, the connections are more peers. Yep, great. Would you like a book? Sure. Right, excuse me. Okay, that's all the time we have. Right. Okay. Well, quick. I think I just broke my phone. Anyway. Yeah, sorry, I just have a question about performance. Really. I mean, the cipher language is clearly. A Sorry, the, uh, the cipher language is clearly a nicer way to, um, to work with graph data than, say, representing it in a relational database using SQL. But what's uh, the performance story generally like putting your graph database in Neo4j? Is Traversing it... any graph database can be super fast because what we're really doing is just reading those connections. And, and um, a native graph database will actually store your graph as a graph. So, so there's very little impedance mismatch between um, the thing that you're, you're, you're symbolically manipulating and the, and, and the actual data itself. So, so that, that can be super fast. Uh, we're working on the Cypher performance all the time. That kind of started as a very sort of experimental thing. Now we're, we're actually hiring people who do RDBMS, or you know, database science, to uh, make it perform. Thanks. Okay. Have a book. We can do one more question. OK. Make it a good one. All right. Um, I was just wondering what the uh, ecosystem is like for GIS software that works with Neo4j or a similar product. Um, uh, so, so like graphical information, um, uh, um, uh, map APIs and that kind of thing. I didn't hear the first like four words, what you said. You wonder what the ecosystem is like for? Uh, GIS starter. Uh, so geographic information systems like uh, maps. Oh, OK. Uh, so, so yeah, there, there is a project called Neo4j Spatial, which does uh, spatial stuff, and we're looking to add some stuff in the future. So, yeah, have a look. All right. All right thank you, everyone. So that's all we've got time for. We have a small gift for Julian. Oh, thank you. And that was really good. Another big round of applause.